So really wonderful turnout tonight. Thanks for coming out on a cold night. Um, just for the purpose of the video, I'm going to reintroduce myself. I'm Lauren McGrath from American University. Um, so we're going to be talking about the science of processing speed, and we're also going to get to what to do around um, interventions and accommodations for processing speed. So we want to we want to cover both the science and the practical aspects tonight. Uh, so let's start off first by, uh, you noticed that um, there's three of us giving a joint presentation. Um, and we wanna just highlight uh, kind of the unique aspects of the fact that we're all working together on this problem. So AU and Lab School have had a partnership now for going on 40 years. Um, so some of you may or may not know that Sally Smith actually founded our Masters of Special Education at American University. Um, shortly after she founded the lab school. And so there's been a long-standing relationship between American University and lab school um, that has been really rich. And most currently, one of the incarnations of that is um, the close work that um, Doug, Melissa, and I have been doing around shared issues about processing speed and working memory and their role in learning disabilities. So we just wanted to sort of highlight there's something unique and really special about what we're doing here. And lab school is really a school that's committed to being on the forefront of research around learning disabilities, which is really, really exciting. So I hope you're going to be able to benefit from those collaborations tonight as part of this, as part of this uh, presentation. So I have a few, um, a few things that I want to cover with you. Um, this is kind of our outline for my portion of what we'll be talking about. So processing speed. Why is it important? How do we measure it? What do we know about what it means for children and what's happening in the brain? And what research questions are unanswered? So I'm gonna give you a, a little spoiler alert. Some of the questions you're gonna have, we don't know the answers to yet. This is a very, um, this is a very new area. So I just wanna lay that out. You, we, we, we don't wanna disappoint you by any means, but a lot of this research is just getting started. So first, I want to just introduce, many of you have heard the term processing, many of you have heard the term processing speed. I want to just kind of lay out what is processing. It's that black box of cognitive operations that our brain does, right? We use it when we don't know exactly what's happening inside. We're talking about processing. Now, processing speed is even more abstract. It's the speed at which you do those things, right? So now we're talking about the speed at which the black box runs. So there's some abstraction here. I'm going to get to the concrete, though, how we try to measure these things. Um, but just to, to distinguish those, you might have heard auditory processing, right? So that's the auditory aspect of processing. And then how quickly you do that would be auditory processing speed. Oops, sorry. So these things are challenging to define. They're even challenging, more challenging to measure. I want to just um, lay out first, why do I think processing speed is important? Um, and this is one of my, um, my favorite kind of summary studies that has come out in the past couple of years. What you can see on the left is a, um, a listing of various different um, disorders that you might find in childhood. And at the top, we've got different domains of executive fun functions. And on this graph, the pluses here mean actually a deficit, so more deficit associated with that disorder. So if we look at just the first, we look at the first column here, we have children with learning disabilities showing a two plus inhibition um, challenge. Children with ADHD, inhibition is even more of a challenge, so you've you got three pluses, so they'd be a little bit more challenged in that way. So this is a layout of inhibition would be um, your ability to stop yourself from a response that's, that's right there on the tip of your tongue. So it might be raising your hand in class, right? <laughs> it could be calling out. Um, so it's, that, it's that being able to stop a certain behavior. So what I want to focus, so this is a layout basically of all of childhood and what the executive functions at research that we've done so far. And as you've been looking at this, I hope it's you're sort of pulling out. I want you to just focus on LD and ADHD here. Uh, and by LD, I mean learning disabilities. Working memory, you've probably heard a lot about in previous um, talks. 
But we also see lots of challenge in the processing speed domain. And uh, MDD is major depression, ODD, oppositional defiant uh, disorder, and Tics and Tourette syndrome. Yeah. Set shifting is another executive function domain. So that's your ability to um, to move into a different um, category of things. So um, we often think about, well, if you're doing a task and you need to stop and go to the next task, that ability to sort of transition, yeah. So what, what we already know, and probably many of you are familiar with, that processing speed can be a challenge in relation to learning disabilities and ADHD. But we also know that it comes along with a lot of different other um, challenges that we might see. So these aren't deterministic by any means, but it's suggesting to us that processing speed is associated with a lot of different things that are happening in childhood. So this is one of the primary reasons why I got really interested in processing speed and um, why I thought this was a really important area to continue doing research. So one processing speed would be mild processing speed problems, two would be moderate, three would be m even more, and four would be the most severe compared to controls when we do our experiments. Yeah. Uh, so basically what I want you to take from this is we know that processing speed is uh, um, a challenge in learning disabilities and ADHD as well as other childhood disorders. Now, I just showed you that, that this seems to be a really important um, problem, and yet when I go to my scientific literature and I type in the word working memory and learning, what I see is there's been about 15,000 studies done, and if I type in the word processing speed and learning, there's only been about 2,000 studies done. And then I do the same thing with the brain. Working memory in the brain, we've done uh, over 10,000 studies. Processing speed in the brain, less than 2,000. So that says to me, this is a really important understudied area, and I'm really encouraged by the turnout here and interest. Uh, one of the things that's been challenging for us as researchers is that I was saying the granting um, agencies are a little less interested in funding processing speed work right now um, because they're seeing it's an old construct, it's hard to measure, and yet I see all of you and your interest in this, and so I'm really hoping this will translate into more research dollars. Um, from, our fund, from our federal government to do this kind of work, because you can see we're way behind working memory. You had a question? Ah, it's a good question. So working memory is um, the ability to hold um, items in mind and manipulate them. So do you want to help me out with an example? You have a? Ah, okay. So. Um, the classic task, of course, is uh, I give you a series of numbers, four, two, six, one. You repeat them to me in the backwards order. So you gotta hold them in mind, and then you gotta flip them around and give them back. So working memory is way ahead of us in the research on processing speed. So not only is this an important problem, but it's a um, understudied problem. So how, how do you measure this? You can do uh, a simple reaction time test. And what I mean by this is uh, an X comes up on the screen. And as soon as you see the X, press a key on the keyboard. So pure motor response. See the X, press the key. The other way is complex processing speed. Complex processing speed is the processing speed that, that I imagine many of you will care most about. This is the comp processing speed that's most associated with academics. And let me, tell, let me show you what a task, a typical task is that we'll give. So you have up here the code, one, two, three, four, five. And then I say to you, with each number is a symbol. And what I want you to do is, down here, write the symbol that goes with the number. And you're going to have two minutes. Do as many of them as you can. OK? So you just copy in the symbols as fast as you can. And at the end of two minutes, I'll count how many you did correctly. So I'm curious to poll the audience. What skills are involved in doing this? 
What do you need to be able to do to do this quickly and well? Yeah. Planning? In terms of how to sequence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we always have kids that want to do all the fives. We don't let, that's not allowed, unfortunately, but <laughs> we always give points for good problem solving strategy if you try that. So, <laughs> good strategy. Short term memory because. If you can remember that what the, uh, they are, you don't have to spend the time looking back, so you'll be faster. So there's a little working memory, we might even say, in this task. What else? Sorry? Eye tracking. Eye -tracking. Going in order. Sorry? Fine motor skills. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we just spitballed a few. There's a lot of different examples. This is not a pure processing speed measure. It has a lot of other stuff in it. And that's what can be inherently unsatisfying about studying processing speed, to be completely honest. These are our tasks that we have, and these are our normed measures, and they're not pure. So this drives everyone nuts. However, these tasks are associated with all those child outcomes that I showed you. So this is important to understand, even though they're impure. So this is my list. You, you got them all, actually, pretty quickly. Symbols, fine motor, scanning, attention, working memory, organization, you got them. So whenever we're measuring processing speed, we're going to have to measure how quickly you do something. And that means that something is going to influence the speed measure. So that's something we have to live with. All right, so we're living with that. How does this relate to reading and attention? So I want to just tell you quickly about a study um, that, that uh, I was a part of and the interesting results that came out of that. So I'll start off just by saying that reading disability and ADHD are something that we call comorbid, which means that if you have reading disability, about 25 to 40% of those kids are going to have ADHD, and vice versa. If you have ADHD, about 25 to 40% of those kids are going to have reading disability. So if we make a Venn diagram, some people just have reading, some people have both, some people just have ADHD. We were trying to understand why does this overlap occur? Is there any cognitive risk factor that's shared between reading disability and ADHD? So you can guess, an, you can guess what the answer is going to be, right? Because this is the processing speed test. So be looking for that. But that was our question that we started off. We didn't know what the answer was going to be. That was our, that was our question. Uh, is there any cognitive risk factor that we can find that will put you at risk for both reading disability and ADHD? So this is decoding here. And then these are some of the same executive functions um, and other cognitive factors that I had showed you previously in, in that table. We have phonological processing, inhibition, verbal working memory, naming speed. So this is how quickly you name colors, letters, numbers, and then our favorite processing speed. And what we saw was that multiple things predict your decoding ability. It's never just one thing. It's always complex. Those multiple things were phonological processing, naming, and processing speed. So multiple predictors of decoding. There were multiple predictors of attention as well. We have inhibition and processing speed. So if you caught the only thing that is shared between reading and attention was processing speed in this study. And that was a really interesting finding, suggesting that it might be a risk factor that is associated with both outcomes. And then we did the study another way, and we added math as an outcome. And we added another cognitive factor. This is your verbal ability. And we found again that processing speed was the only predictor of reading, attention, and math as an outcome. So it's starting to look like a generalized risk factor for many different um, academic outcomes. And that was very interesting to us. And that's a, um, that's a study, actually, the math study just came out this week. Um, so that's brand new, hot off the presses. So we're really, we're really interested in this. What we're, what we're summarizing this to be is reading. Processing speed is related to reading both your reading fluency 
and there's continued debate about decoding. We're showing that association. Now, I want to really highlight this because this is counterintuitive. Processing speed is associated with attention. Now, you might be thinking of kids that are hyperactive and running all over the place, right? They're re really sort of speedy in their motor abilities. But actually, what we're showing is that when you test them on the measures, they're, they're uh, performing more slowly. So even though there's sort of a speedy presentation or a feeling that they're moving quickly between things, when we actually test it, it actually is that the kids are looking um, a little, little slower um, than controls. So we, at this point, we don't know the answer of why that is. We're trying to figure out if you had attention problems, why would you perform more slowly on that, um, that coding test that I told you? For lots of different reasons. Maybe you didn't sustain attention. Maybe you would find motor difficulties that went along with it. Maybe you didn't organize and sequence in order. So that's, that's sort of the unknown. All we know is that there is an association at this point. Both your math fluency, processing speed is associated with, as well as um, some of these computational pieces. So those are the empirical findings, and now we have to understand why might that be? So what's going on in the brain related to this? And what we see is um, our best guess is that processing speed is related to myelin in the brain. So myelin is the insulation around neurons. So neurons are here, they have an axon, and they have this insulation around them, which allows them to fire quickly. So essentially, think of a wire with the insulation. If the insulation is on there, it's able to fire more efficiently. What I have here is a picture of um, the different white matter tracks in the brain. We've gotten really sophisticated in how we can image the brain now, particularly these white matter tracks. And what we suspect is that processing speed might be a little bit slower because of these um, related to the myelin and the efficiency that's happening. So why would that impact reading? And if you think about it, yes? It would be our guess. So first, let me say, we don't know. This is our best guess. What we know is that in normal aging, myelin tends to break down just as a process in the brain, and we get slower as we age. So we're guessing in children, but there's been very few studies in kids. So I can't answer conclusively, but my best guess is that it would be less. Now, reading is a task in the brain that requires integration of visual areas, language areas. If you're going to be comprehending what you're going to be thinking about, then you're going to have to integrate that with your executive functions. So you're going to require connectivity of lots of different brain regions. That means that that connectivity needs to be very efficient for efficient reading. So I hope that's clear. Essentially, if you're able to do processing speed tasks quickly, it's suggesting that the connectivity of the brain is working well, and therefore reading would go well because the um, areas can connect efficiently and fluidly. And I'm, let me look at the time here. Um, I, do it? Yeah? OK. I got a video for you. We see the, the back of the brain light up first, and then the whole brain gets involved in a rich uh, symphony of activity. It actually moves back and forth. It's not just uh, one directional. So we've just been talking about. So he's going to say, you, that's what happens in the brain when an adult is reading just one word. So that spread of activity from the back of the brain to the front. And did you notice it kind of oscillates too? Back and forth, back and forth. So that is connections in the brain. Um, thank you. That's, that's efficient connections reading one single word. So imagine what the brain looks like when you're having to read a paragraph. And you're going to have to integrate quickly. And so what this leads us to hypothesize at this point is that processing speed and reading are depending on this myelin and efficiency to connect these brain areas in order to do the cognitive operations we're talking about. So that's sort of the science behind where we're going with this. 
So you're probably all wondering, and we're gonna spend a lot more time on this, so can we improve processing speed? Right now, no. <laughs> I'm sorry for the disappointing answer. What we can do, though, is good accommodations and encourage, um, encourage ways that children can advocate for themselves and parents can advocate, and the ways that you can set up the environment, they're gonna support the most efficient, effective, speedy performance from kids. And we know a lot about how to do that, and you're gonna hear more about that. But I wanna just caution you um, to maintain not even cautious opti optimism, but skeptical optimism. <laughs> don't, don't get rid of the optimism, but be very skeptical um, about cognitive interventions that are purporting to improve processing speed. What we've been able to see is that if you practice a task, you will indeed get faster at it. What that won't do is translate to another speedy task. So there are companies out there, you, you might have heard Cogmed, Lumosity, um, that have advertised kind of benefits, and in fact Lumosity has um, had some interesting news stories recently that you can look up. Um, but you get faster at the task you practice, so that's good news. What we can't do yet is get faster at different tasks. So practice the thing that you want to get faster at, is, is, is the answer. It's, it's, it's not, um, it's sort of grandmother's wisdom, right? <laughs> doesn't generalize. As far what we with what we have right now, does not generalize. So I just want to leave you with what we're doing in my lab, our, our kind of what's next steps. We're asking the question of whether processing speed can explain why we see high rates of overlap among different learning disabilities and um, and other challenges. So I'm adding to my Venn diagram here language impairment. I already gave you this number, about 25 to 40% of kids with reading disability have ADHD and vice versa. We know that there's overlap here, about 25 to 60%. We know there's overlap here, 25 to 40%. And then things get more complicated. Math disability sits on top of there. Anxiety sits on top of there. And it starts to it starts starts to pile on. And so our question is, this kernel in the middle is processing speed at the middle of it, at the center of it. And that's kind of our research question um, right now. I expect to hear more from Lauren. We're going to be going back and forth a little bit. So I'm Doug Fagan. I'm the director of psychological services here at Lab School. Great to see you all. Um, and uh, my, as I'm talking a little bit, I'm going to have um, some folks handing out uh, some sheets. Oh, my, my request for you uh, before we do an exercise in a few moments is simply keep your sheet uh, face down for now, and we'll do that in a, uh, just a few moments. So they'll they'll all come around. So. Um, my question, I, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I come from a, a little bit of a different angle from Dr. McGrath. Um, I think that's my angle right there, um, the kids that you have at home, the kids we work with. Um, so the question, I, first I want to ask you is, how many of you have somebody at home, um, a child, a spouse, yourself, that you care about who has slow processing speed or you think they, wow, fabulous. So for the camera, that's pretty much everybody. Um, <laughs> We're glad you're here then. And so this should be a good question for you. Um, so we've talked a lot about what processing speed is um, and how it's kind of this hidden piece that goes in our, in our brain and it's how work gets done at either a, a, a quick clip or an average speed or really slow. And so you, many of you will know then, the next question I'm gonna ask you is, what are some of the emotional, psychological, I'll even say family factors that happen when you have slow processing speed? What happens at home when you have a child who has slow processing speed? I'll take a few, go ahead. So your daughter steps in and finishes your husband's sentences, great. Frustration, frustration, excellent. Avoidance, a lot of avoidance in the back. A lot of stress on the person who's got slow processing speed and the, their parental units around them, excellent. They need more time in the day, we all need, we all need more time in the day, right? Yeah. Self-esteem is a huge one. We're going to come to all these. These are great. Let me take a few more. They give up trying. It's what we call learned helplessness, all right, like let, 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 reduce persistence. Peer relationships are 
are impacted negatively. We'll talk about that both from a language perspective and a psychological perspective. Excellent. One more. Is there one more? Excellent. Um, all of those things happen, um, and they're complicated. So I want to give you sort of, uh, as Lauren talked about, um, these are complicated dynamics. We, we're only beginning to understand processing speed. One thing we do know, and that you all just share with us, is that it has many diverse and important impact on psychological, social, and emotional functioning. And of course, as with any of these complicated factors with our, with our kids, um, they're multi-directional and complex. So we have processing speed up here, which is an important factor. And at the bottom, we have emotional difficulties here. And you see these arrows go around in a circle and in a cycle. So slow processing speed can have many different effects, right? It certainly slows us down with academics. Everything we do in life, and you only know this when you have a slow processing speed person at home, everything we do is timed. Not just time test, everything we do is timed. Getting up in the morning, making dinner, right? Getting out, out, out the door, everything is timed when you have slow processing speed because you run up against that. So academic difficulties, stress in terms of reading, in terms of math, in terms of comprehension, everything is slowed. Um, period, but everything's slowed, especially when in the group dynamic of a classroom. Because once you're slow, it's hard, but when you're slower than everybody else, that's multiple layers of frustration, right? So you have academic difficulties, language difficulties, which, which you mentioned before, but that impacts performing in the classroom because it takes longer to raise your hand and to think about what your answer is going to be. And by the time you raise your hand, you're two questions behind, right, already before you even raise your hand. Um, social struggles. And we'll talk about in a few minutes, we'll give you an example. When you're talking with a peer, just one peer, it's hard to keep up with the conversation. When you're in a room with five 11-year-olds who are all talking at the same time, it's really, really, really difficult. And these, thing impact, these things impact emotions, frustration, reduced um, effort, right, stress, um, lethargy. These, all these things can be, so it, so it depends on your child, all these things can manifest, right? Lethargy, reduced effort, perfectionism. Sometimes some kids with slow processing speed have to do everything perfect, which just makes them even slower, slower. Decreased motivation. I'm just, I'm just going to give up. It doesn't really work anymore. Go ahead. Um, some do and some don't. But when kids are slower, sort of the only thing they can do is do it right because they can't do it fast. And only some kids do that. Go ahead. Hypervigilance is sort of, if, if you are in a classroom of 10 people and nine of them are finished and you're always, are, you're always the last one around, you're always kind of worrying, who's, am I behind again? People looking at me, what's wrong with me that I'm so much slower, okay? Um, go ahead, one more. The lethargy can be about sort of fatigue, so they're just kind of exhausted. Or sometimes always being slow. I think there's some there's some quality of that where they're, they're just kind of tired and not able to kind of persist. It can just be kind of a, a, a associated with the style of processing speed, or it can be a result of sort of the, the effort that's always being poured in. I think it depends on the child. Um, sometimes, I would add, sometimes, yeah. sometimes you're hearing people talk about a sluggish tempo. Uh, that's become a little bit more of a common term that folks are using to try to you know name that that's that lethargy. I think the term they often use is sluggish cognitive tempo, which is a really fancy jargon word for just my kid is always just so slow in how they do things. And even their personality is kind of slow, how they work. So this is not um, sort of point to point to point. This is kind of a range of the reactions that we can have. And it's to show you that slow processing speed in many ways can lead to emotional struggles. And emotional struggles can then lead to slow processing speed. And you can see the cycle develop. And you see it happen at home, correct? You see this happen at home. And there's no, not one place that it starts, because it's a cycle. And the, the thing we want to give you a little hope tonight is that just like anything that, that increases can make it worse, any point of intervention in the cycle can actually make it better. We'll talk about the different routes for that in a few minutes. So like Lauren said, we can't make their speed faster. But there's many pieces here that we can use to try to um, stop the cycle a little bit and make it less um, pathological and less disruptive in their, in their life, in your family's life. Okay. Um, so I want you to, um, in a moment, uh, most of you have hopefully either a white or a pink sheet. Don't turn it over just yet. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is a simple task. We can do some processing speed work together, okay? I hope most folks have gotten one. What I'm going to ask you to do is you're going to see some rows of numbers. Um, hope there, most people have, hopefully have a pen or pencil, something to write with. You're going to see some rows of numbers. All I'm going to ask you to do in a moment 
is to go across the rows and simply circle the numbers that are alike in each row. Just circle the numbers that are alike or identical in each row. That's all I'm gonna ask you to do. You're gonna have one minute to do that. When I say, when I say go, hold on, when I say go, um, and what I want you to do is to focus on your own work, on your own page. Um, focus, uh, uh, I'll, ex I'll explain more in a moment. Focus on your own work, and I want you to just notice what the experience is like, so we can talk about processing speed. So you simply, yes, yeah, so, and when you're finished, please you let me know, when you're finished, turn your page back over so you, all you see is the blank sheet. Any questions? Do you have a minute? I'm gonna ask you to, to uh, you, you, can, you can underline a circle. You can underline a circle, whatever, you can underline, you, both are fine. You can underline a circle, so I want you to have a minute. When my timer goes off, I'll ask you to stop. Um, and all I want you to do is go across the rows and circle the two numbers that are identical. Any questions? Are you ready? Go ahead. All right. Pencils down, pens down. Um, so my first question, um, who, found that, who found that task quite easy? Excellent. Who found that task challenging and difficult? Excellent. So again, keep your sheets over for now. Um, for the, for the, raise your hand if you finished. In a minute, excellent. Hands down, and raise your hands if you didn't finish. Good. What I want you to do is, um, first, again, before I show you the next slide, just take note, what, can somebody tell me what that, for the folk, those folks who didn't finish or if it was challenging, tell me a little bit about what, that, what the experience was like, please. Go ahead. High anxiety, high anxiety. Excellent. Anybody else feel anxious as they were doing it? Good, good, what else? Elevated heart rate, yeah, right, good. Go ahead. A lot of numbers to compare, right? Right? Anything else? Go ahead. It, it was strangely competitive, right? And we're, and we're adults, and we're not getting graded, right? Think about this, right? So, so a number of you, um, it was very difficult because you had this, right? Right? Raise your hand if you had this. Yeah? Okay. So right now, you have slow processing speed. Okay? Raise your hand if you had that. Right? So those of you who had this, you are your kids. Right? That is what it's like every day to wake up with slow processing speed. The whole class is doing this, but you have to do this every day. And you don't have me a minute later kind of leaving the anxiety by explaining to you that it's a different task, because it's really the same task, but it feels like this to you, right? That's math, and that's reading, and that's listening to your teacher, or your mother say, how was your day at school today, right? Or where's your homework? These kids don't only have slow processing speed in class, and they don't, have, they don't have only have it when we're frustrated with them. It's how their brain works. And so it was strangely competitive, and that was one minute, right? And you're not being graded. Um, but our kids have this every day, and they are being graded by their teachers, and they're also being, I say graded, but they're also being evaluated by the people who love them because they want to be good kids, and they want to comply with what we do, and they want to make us proud. And they know when they're slow doing their homework, and it's 9 o'clock at night, and they should have done finished two hours ago, it, everybody's looking at them, so it must th be my fault if I'm so slow, and my brother's finished and my classmates are finished, obviously I'm doing something wrong, right? And we're gonna talk about that piece, the blame piece and the frustration piece, but this is how their brain works every day. So I appreciate, I, I wanna thank you for your cooperation with that piece, but I think, I want you, I want you to take that home with you if you can. Go ahead. Oh, great question. That's a great question. The question is, is there a distinction between slow processing speed and intelligence? After I answer this question, we can actually go home. That's, that, that's, that is a fabulous question. Um, there is a complete and total distinction between processing speed and intelligence. On the intelligence measures that we administer, processing speed is one of the things we measure, and it varies, um, but is not in any way the same thing as intelligence. It's one thing that we measure because it's important, but we have, a, we have a whole school full of very, very bright kids who are often very slow at processing speed. So everybody hear that. So processing speed and intelligence are related. They are not at all the same. Um, it's not unlike a speech language disability or something else that undermines their functioning, 
for otherwise very, very bright children? Great question. I'm glad you asked that. Go ahead. Um, we're going to, that's a great one. So processing speed and ADHD, I think you gave numbers before, correct? Um, in terms of, okay, so the, I don't actually have numbers. I think that when you, uh, my, my most recent num uh, understanding of low processing speed and ADHD is an elevated risk. I don't have, I don't have clear numbers. Do you have those, Dr. McGrath? I'm speaking from clinical experience and also Dr. McGrath is saying we don't have clear numbers on that overlap. There's a lot of comorbidity in all these areas. Um, so once you have, um, an, a slow processing speed is not a disability. It's, a, it's, a, it's part of a profile. But ADHD increases your, your risk of a number of things, including learning, dis learning disabilities. I'm not sure what the numbers are for slow processing speed. It's a good question, but we don't have clear answers. But it's, it definitely, they definitely are they definitely coexistence, but I'm not sure what the rates are. It's a good question, though. Um, so you know, you, you share with me all these, right? When you process slowly and you're in a class with 10 or 20 kids who you want to look at you in a certain way, you are self-conscious, you are anxious, you feel, what was the word you said, competitive, right? Strangely competitive. You feel, um, it's when, uh, did you, who noticed the people next to them finishing and you thought, what the, <laughs> right? Right, you felt that. Yeah. Can I, can I ask for bravery? Did anybody fake it and turn it over when they weren't done? Anybody do that? Right? Our kids, our kids do that. Our kids will rush through things because I'd rather be fast than right. I'd rather keep up than be right. All these things can be part of it. You mentioned self-esteem. It's a huge thing. If you're going slow, everybody knows. They're all looking at you, kind of, you know, or you think they're looking at you like, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Um, and frustration, because you think, as you, as you asked before, I'm smart, I know I'm smart, and yet I'm always last. And if we as adults don't know that slow processing speed is different from, from, from uh, intelligence, if we don't know that, they certainly assume they're the same thing. Because in life, if you're fast, you're good, right? In sports, in schoolwork, if you're fast, you're good. That's how America works. And our kids pick up on that. And, and you'll get better and faster. So the, the implicit connection between speed and intelligence, which you, which you pointed out, is when our kids, is not lost in our kids, especially our slow processing speed kids. Um, so we're gonna actually jump ahead. We often tend to put the what can you do at the end, um, and that and usually that winds up being the last minute and a half, which drives me as an audience crazy, and I'm sure it isn't something you don't wanna do. So we're gonna give you some what to do's now, and then sort of give you a little bit more foundation as we finish up tonight. Um, so the first, I hope, hope some of these we've kind of already hinted at, but I want to give you a sense, if we can't make our kids faster, you're all here, what can we do? What can we do? And the answer is really a lot. I want you to think about that cycle we talked about before. Everything we're talking about in terms of competitiveness, competitiveness and self-esteem and anxiety, all that's rooted in, why am I slow? Something must be wrong with me. Why am I slow? I must be not that smart. Why am I slow? I must be not as good as my, as my peers. So the first piece, and we do this at lab school, is part of the reason why we're here as a special school, but even if your student doesn't go to lab school, you can do this as a parent. Everybody has, and I do psych testings. This is something I talk about with parents whenever I do informing sessions after I do testings. We all have psychological profiles. We all have cognitive strengths and weaknesses. Every one of us do. I, as your dad, I'm really good at X, but when it comes to Y, I'm just in the toilet. I can't do that very well. So th the first piece is modeling. We all have cognitive profiles. So we're not. None of us all have 105 across the board. Nobody does. I've tested you know, hundreds of kids. I've never seen a kid with a, a consistently solid profile across the board. We all have peaks and valleys. So you, dear child, for you, you're really smart, but things just take slower for you. Things take longer for you. It's just the way your brain works, period. Why? I'm not really sure. Everybody has different brains. You know, For me, I'm really good at this. Kids will get. Kids know they're all different. They, they, they're in PE. Some kids finish fast, some kids finish slow. We don't have to teach that to our kids. We have to simply explain to them that that, that part of life is true in their brain as well. You're great at music, and you're great at art, and you're great at math, but when it comes to doing things fast, really hard for you. So other kids who are working as hard as you will finish faster, you'll just take longer. It's just the way your brain works, period. That's why you go to lab school. That's why you get extended time. That's why dad and I decided to pick you up early. So you, whatever the, the story is, this is just how your brain works. We don't whitewash it. Don't make it seem like it's perfectly fine and they can't be disappointed about it. But also I wouldn't overplay it as a, 
a woe is me thing. We all have, diff we all have things that are, that, are, that are difficult for us. If we had to all dance for a living, I'd be unemployed. I mean, there are, all, there are things where all of us are not good at, right? I mean, it's easy for me when I talk to my kids about the list of things I'm not good at. We're all able to do that. Um, so emotion, expectations and acceptance. You should expect that when you take a test, even if you know all the answers, you're probably going to be slower. So you're going to get extended time. And just remember, if your teacher doesn't give it to you, you can just remind them. Whatever the, whatever the strategy is, this is just who you are. If they go into class expecting, you know what, I got this. I'll be slow, but I got this. You've done your job, and we've done our job. So expectations and acceptance. If they go in thinking, okay, it's a test. I studied hard. I'm going to nail this. And all their friends who didn't study as hard as they did finished before them, and they were not prepared for that, it's disappointing. They're frustrated, and, and they're upset. But if they go in thinking, I got this. I'm slow, but I'm going to get this. That's the story they're telling themselves, and it's actually pretty true. Right? We don't have this myth that we're all the same speed. So I want to just, the first piece, expectations and acceptance. This is how your brain works. It's who you are, this is what to expect. Um, we actually do that with everything, whether it be um, any kind of weakness we have. Name it, tame it. The more you just name what your weakness is, and you go in knowing this is how my brain works, everything looks different. You're putting on a different set of glasses. Okay, so I want to just really remind people to go home with that. Um, the second one's for all of us. I'm from New York, so I tend to speak fast. But we all do this sometimes. Um, when you're talking to your child and saying, go upstairs, get your sneakers, come down for dinner and set the table, you lost them at go upstairs, <laughs> right? One instruction at a time, go upstairs and get your sneakers. Okay, come back down. One thing at a time. And they'll sometimes track it. And if they don't, their job is to say, mom, what would you say? And you can repeat it. And the more upset we are, or rushed we are, or frustrated we are, the less understanding we are as parents, right? That's how this kind of works. So to remind yourself that slowing down is really gonna help them. Um, and the emotional tone is so important. Um, I think when, <clears throat> when we talk with our kids, we often know what we're saying, but they know what we're feeling. So you may just think you're saying, go to your room and get this, and they're looking at you, wow, dad had a really bad day. Right? And we could spend 10 minutes talking about the brain functions and how the part of the brain that's, that triggers emotions shuts down your executive functions. So when you see somebody you love or are afraid of or respect or care about, like a parent, and they're upset, what you hear is wah, 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 right? That's what you hear. So the emotional tone is really, really important. When you're upset, which we sometimes are, to take a deep breath and remember, realize that you're upset and maybe that's going to impact your communication, slow down. It often helps to say, sweetheart, I had a really rough day, so I'm a little bit frustrated. And while we think that's going to make it worse, a lot of research on executive functioning says that when you can name your feeling, again, you're, just, you're engaging a different part of your brain, that feeling actually turns down a little bit in volume. Again, the, the, the irony of that, when you name what you're feeling, you're controlled by that feeling a little bit less. I'm really frustrated because something happened at work today. Okay, let's, come, let's go and have dinner. Let's, go do, let's work on your homework. When you can name it, first of all, it's not the worrying about, uh-oh, what happened today? Then, they, oh, mom's upset, but she can talk about it. I guess she's in control. Let's go. We can do this now. But when, you're, when your emotions are on your face but not in your words, it's a very different dance with kids. And you know that from your spouse, your friends, your kids. Right? When, they're, when they look upset, it's hard to manage. When they say, oh, I'm really disappointed because Bobby was mean to me today. Oh, I can... I can, man I can manage that. Let me help you with that, right? But when the emotions are just there, it's very much, much, much harder. And then blame. Um, a lot of this involves self-blame. We'll talk about blame in a few minutes. But when we talk about slow speed, um, one of the hardest parts for kids is that not only, am I, not only am I slow, but it's my fault. And so if there's an understanding of the family that for Jack, things take him longer, and so when he's eating dinner and he's the last one trailing always to finish dinner, he can just say, Mom, remember it's me? <laughs> you know, I, I'm slow. Like that, that understanding, removing the blame, can change the discussion dramatically. So if you can be aware of the expectations and acceptance, the language and the blame, and how blame's implicit. Our kids, even the ones who drive us crazy, um, really want to do the best they can and please us and, and do a good job. When we're frustrated with them, one thing they hear is blame. You're doing it again. If you can be aware of and minimize any implicit blame and say, you know what, sweetheart, 
I'm just having a rough day. I know things take you longer. Why don't you work on that? And I'll come back in, ch in a few minutes and check on you. To just name it. Name how you're feeling. Name that, they're, name in an, uh, uh, that, they're, that their um, brain works that way, in a non-blaming way, and engage with them around it. It's not the speed that gets in the way. It's what happens when we can't manage the speed, right? Now, mornings are really hard because mornings have a clock around them, so you have to have routines that build that in. Uh, mornings are just really difficult. But you can still say, okay, what I want you to do is X and Y, come back, we'll do this, and let's go ahead and we'll go out the door. Like really making it clear and being aware of what you can use in the environment to make that go faster. Um, but still rem remembering that when you remove blame, there's less irritation across the board, and they actually go faster. Right? When they're upset, you've now lost a good deal of time, right? and, and, and everybody's upset. Um, so just a few more tips, and we'll, we'll give you some more strategies for the classroom as well. Um, nobody knows your kids as well as you do. We have a language in my house that when somebody's getting upset, and you can see it in their face, we call it overload mode. Um, no matter what you say, you know they're not going to hear anything you say because they're, they're pretty much on the tip of that mountain of being overwhelmed. And you know what? Looks like you're in overload mode. Why don't you take a, take a deep breath? You want a hug? You drink a water? Just knowing any content you have about let's just finish the homework is not going to be helpful. When their slow speed leads to overload mode and you see it happening, you just lost 15 minutes. Um, but at least it can only be 15 minutes if you give them some time and have them recover and not 45 minutes or an hour. So I think they're gone. Once they're in that place, you're not going to engage this part of their brain that can process information. The part of their brain that's activated is the emotional part of their brain. And so just acknowledging the feelings, you're really upset and frustrated, what can I do to help? Why don't you take a few minutes to calm down? That can really kind of increase their engagement and reduce the overwhelmed piece. And just have some language in your house that says, it looks like you're overwhelmed, which is one of my favorite words with kids because it simply speaks to, I can't handle this right now. I just can't, it's too much. Um, and I think as, as parents, when you have something you want to communicate, um, we're often pretty clear about what we want. And so, time for dinner, come to dinner, 30 seconds. Okay, now they're not here. And you, right, you see it coming, and they're f I'm just finishing, I'm just finishing. And you can feel it, your own, own anger kind of boiling in your, in your own head, right? Um, just be aware, their processing speed doesn't get faster the matter you get, right? It doesn't. <laughs> I, I've been there. I asked you three times that. Well, you're asking every three seconds. So of course, you've asked three times. So, so giving them some lead time and saying, dinner's in five minutes. I'm going to give you one more warning. Dinner's in two minutes. OK, let's, and, and trying to kind of escort them and just knowing that their speed, just because you've done it for the, every day for the last six years doesn't mean they're actually going to get it. Right? You, you kind of said it. Giving them some lead time and saying, sweetheart, come in. I'm going to come in a minute and turn the light off. I'm going to come in a minute and you know, the iPad's going to go off, whatever it is. Let's just do this. But that needs to be part of your routine. When kids are slow, they don't get faster when they're 7 or 8 or 10 or 13 or 15. They're slower, and so we have to build our lives around them. Go ahead. How do you not equate slow speed with intelligence? And the answer is, because I told you. <laughs> and you're going to remember that I told you that slow speed is an intelligence, even though it should be. And we want it to be, and it looks like intelligence, right? I mean. It looks like it, but it's not. Uh, intelligence is a lot of things. Speed is, speed is a component of it. But we have a lot of kids who, if you ask what's the capital of England, right, a lot of kids raise their hands. And then a bunch of kids raise their hands about four seconds later. Are those kids less smart? They're just slower. They know. And often, they're, they're probably more right than the other kids who raised their hand really fast and said, Belgium, right? But the, the slower kids said, London but they're just slower. I think about, think about your car, right? Some of us have amazing cars, um, but no, they, can't all, they can't all go 300 miles an hour, right? The, the, the speed is important, but the speed isn't the same as intelligence. It's one facet of intelligence that drives parents in particularly crazy, because you, you, you have a schedule. It's a great, a great segue. So I think our job, and Melissa is going to take over in just a minute, is to, we can't usually slow the whole world down to their speed. We can slow it down a little bit, and we can give them some workarounds. And the question is, can we make the gap small enough so they can reach across? Because we can slow, because our kids have a variety of, some, some processing speed at, I'll say 80, I'll use scores 85 or 80 or 70. So there's a variety of s speeds are, uh, is, is, a, is not a dichotomous thing. It's a whole continuous thing. We have kids who are very fast, somewhat fast, average, there's a whole continuum. So. Um, 
we can slow the pace down a little bit in school for them. Not, this, not the same right speed for all of them because they're all different speeds, right? We have, we have kids with all different speeds in a classroom. It's the teacher's job to slow the speed down for them somewhat and accommodate. Um, and then we have to teach our kids how they can catch that train, even when it's going a little bit faster than they can go. I'll take one more, then I'll pass it off to Melissa. Go ahead. You're talking about a, a great dialectic. I'll just speak to it briefly. Anybody have um, sort of athletes in the house, like kids who play sports, right? So if you have a kid who say loves basketball, he can go out for hours and shoot, shoot foul shots and get better. Does it necessarily mean he's going to play in the NBA someday? He'll get better. He may not even be good enough to play in his, on his school team, or he may not. He'll get better. The better is what usually happens. So with reading or math, you can get faster. You may not even be average, depending on, because the speed has a range. And I'm, tell me if I'm, if I'm overstepping. The speed has a range. You can improve your skills. Doesn't mean you're going to get average or above average. You're going to improve with time. But it may only be moderately, like with, like with a sport. Does that make sense? So the acceptance piece, I think, is acceptance and remediation. We want to kind of improve our kids' skills. But know that if they have a significant deficit, we're going to simply try to improve that floor. But it's not going to be up to sort of um, the average range. And we're going to then have to have them have the world kind of accommodate to them a little bit. One more. Go ahead. So I'll paraphrase. How do you stay sane while having kids, <laughs> while having kids practice things to get faster when they're slow and it takes a long time? Right? I think one thing, and maybe you can speak to this as well, Melissa, one thing I'll just say briefly before I hand it off is that be aware of the time. So if, it's, if, the, if your child, ha is, child is spending all this time at home, decide what's, what's most important, whether it be homework or practicing, and put a time limit on it. So we have kids, what we'll often tell kids, you know what, if he's working after an hour and a half, put the homework away, and that's it for that day. And you can write a note saying he worked for an hour and a half and was pretty focused, but he couldn't finish it. Um, well, I, th I think we're talking about accommodation and remediation. So, so sometimes there'll be a grade that, that's an impact. But if, if we're talking about kids where speed's really slow, and that's a dialogue with the school, um, we'll often be asked to re uh, reduce homework. That's something that's frequently re requested. Not eliminate homework, or not necessarily make it less uh, unstressful, which is hard to do, because stress is something that kids pr pick up. But I think it's a real balance between having them work on things, but also managing that time commitment. So I'm going to, before, before I, I ask, answer, I'm going to want to hand it over to Melissa. We're happy to answer more questions as we go, um, but thank you. Okay. So let's, let's come back to that, because I think what we're going to talk about as we continue on is that there is such a balance between how we accommodate, how we intervene, what we practice, how often we practice it, and then what the end result is. Uh, and I think the first thing that we need to say when we think about school is that processing speed impacts our kids throughout the entire school day. And I'm talking about from a linguistic perspective here, but there are other components of that brain work like Lauren talked to us about. And so just to show you, when we are in a classroom all day, every day, we are being asked to listen, speak, socially interact with our peers and with adults. We're being asked to read and we're being asked to write. All of those things play into processing speed. And what's important is that some of those aspects we can control ourselves as individuals. So if you picture a dial, when we're reading, it may not be as fast as we want it to be. It may not be as fast as our peer next to us, but we control the pace at which we read the text in front of us, okay? Same thing with writing. I control how fast I write the word onto the paper. It might not be as fast as I want it to be. It might not be as fast as my teacher wants it to be. And it might not be as fast as the person next to me, but I control it, okay? I can mediate that. The other areas about in that oral language column, we can't mediate. That dial is set by someone else. Right, the teacher who's talking really fast, your peers who are talking really fast, and even for yourself as a speaker, how quick the expectation is for you to generate a response. Okay, so when we think about frustration and anxiety and all of those things, and when we think about school being really hard, we do need to appreciate that for kids with processing speed deficits, school is going to be hard. Okay, and we know this for kids who struggle with lots of different areas. School may not be their best time of the day. Okay, school is hard. 
So let's talk about what we can do in two different categories in the classroom, okay? Category one is the accommodation piece, right? So this is really how we think about our environment, the people who are in our environment, and what changes they make. Not me as the child with the processing speed deficit, but somebody else. And a lot of these are typical. For those of you who have kids, you've probably seen these on documents and IEPs and things like that. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, okay? But let me just highlight a couple of, of favorites. Okay, how many of you have heard of think time? Just a few, okay. So for the rest of you, let me introduce you to think time, okay? It's a simple phrase, but really what it is is it's implying that I, as somebody who struggles with processing speed, need a little bit of extra time to think about what you're saying to me, and in turn, I need a little bit of extra time to think about what I'm going to say back to you, okay? It's a really powerful thing in a classroom when as a teacher you say, Lauren, I'm gonna come to you next and ask you about the causes of the Civil War. And then I go away and I come to you and I ask you a different question and then just as I promised, I go back to Lauren and ask her that question. I've given her think time. I've told her what the question is. I've given her time to process what my question was, think about it, think about what her answer will be, and then I come back to her, okay? You can do the same thing in the car. So when I pick up my six-year-old, who struggles with processing speed, and I say to him, how's your day today? He says, okay, do you wanna tell me anything about your day? Nope. Did you do anything fun? I'm not, I'm not talking to you. Okay, okay did, did, so nothing fun? Mom, I don't wanna talk about it. And that's frustrating, right? And then I'm angry and I'm frustrated. Let's go with frustrated, okay? But what I've learned to say to him is, okay, well, I would love to hear about that later. Maybe we can talk more at dinner. And what I have done is I've given him think time, okay? I now know what I'm going to ask him. He knows what I'm going to ask him. And I've given him time to think about that question and think about how he can answer it. And often, I get a pretty good response at dinner. Let's be honest, it's not always, okay? So think time is powerful. It's also powerful when you teach kids to ask for think time, okay? And we're gonna talk about that with self-advocacy. Routines is something that Doug spoke to, but I wanna also mention that within the construct of giving directions. Oftentimes, we think we're giving one direction because it's the same direction we give every night, okay? Go upstairs and get ready for bed. What does that include? Anybody, what does that include? Take a shower, brush your teeth, retainer, put on your pajamas, put your clothes in the hamper, maybe. Anything else, maybe if you have little ones, pick out a book that I can read to you, right? So there are so many steps inherent in just one direction, which is go get ready for bed, okay? Once that becomes a routine and you've identified it as a routine, do your five. Okay, what is your five? Whatever you want it to be in your house, okay? Clothes in the hamper, pajamas on, teeth, face, pick out a book, okay? But if that's your five and that's your five every time, then instead of just giving that vague get ready for bed, you say do your five. And you might have to review it. Okay, but you, what you've done is you've broken them down. You've given a routine, and you're using keywords like first, you do this. Second, you brush your teeth. Third, and then guess what? You repeat it, and you rephrase it, and you say it again slowly. Shower jammies teeth, I heard someone say, right? It's your top three, it's like cell phone keys wallet. Right, you need a routine. It's what you check every day before you leave the house, right? Our kids need routines, these kids definitely do. Okay, I'm gonna share these with your teachers, share these with each other. I just wanna speak to the last one before we move on for the sake of time. Assistive technology is fantastic. We love technology and technology is great as an accommodation, but please note the asterisk, okay? Assistive technology on its own cannot be the only tool that your child uses because it needs instruction to go with it, okay? So important. So if you are somebody who struggles to read quickly, 
we could give you an electronic reader, and that will read the book for you. But it doesn't slow down the pace. Okay? It doesn't help you comprehend it necessarily. So there's a lot that has to go with assistive technology. Okay? I'm not saying don't use it. We love assistive technology. But anytime someone just tries to throw a device or a program at you, it's not enough. Okay? There has to be instruction that goes with it. And that could be a whole entire presentation in and of itself, but I just offer it as a cautionary, a cautionary asterisk. Okay? The other side of the coin is what many of you are asking about, and that's, but what about the instruction? What about the intervention? There's got to be something other than what somebody else does, right? What, what does my student do? What do they learn? And there are really important things for our students to learn if they struggle with processing speed. The first is something that Doug spoke about, and that's self-advocacy. It's all well and good for us to know what our kids need, but they need to know what they need, and they need to know how to ask for it. So I need think time. I need extra time. I need a break. Can you repeat that? Huh? Right. And oftentimes, what it sounds like in a classroom, if your child doesn't have great self-advocacy skills, is huh? Or nothing. Or oh. Or I think I get it. Right, but they're not really asking a concise or a clarifying question to help the people around them know where to go, how to help. So self-advocacy is number one. We need to teach our kids what to ask for. Okay? There are lots of pieces from a language standpoint that I could tell you about. Listening for keywords, learning certain strategies, organizational templates. Again, that's a whole day. But let's talk about reading because many of you had questions about that. Okay? Reading, as Lauren told you, is, has been studied and is associated with processing speed deficits. But what is reading fluency? Because that's the area that we know is very much linked to processing speed. For most of us, we think fluency means how fast you read, the rate. And that's a part of it, but it's only one part. Okay, And this is really important. So reading fluency encompasses rate, your speed, but also your phrasing and the intonation with which you read. You need all three of those components in order to comprehend. And let me give you an example, but let me take the language out. All right, so the screen's gonna go black. I'll, I'll come back, I promise but you can't see what I, what I want you to hear. I'm going to play you something. I want you to listen and tell me if you can identify what you're listening to, number one, and number two, see how I'm breaking down the steps for you, okay? And number two, if it invokes any feeling, okay? So listen, number one, do you know what this is? And number two, does it invoke any feeling? Just by a show of hands, did anybody recognize that? Okay. It reminds you of your son's piano lesson. Okay. Don't tell me if you know what it is, if you know what that actual piece of music is. But raise your hand if you think you recognize it. OK, a couple of you. I will tell you that the notes were played correctly, every single one of them. We could say that in reading terms, that was decoded correctly. OK, each word, each note was read correctly. Did it invoke feeling from any of you? Did you have that? That moment when you listen to music where you're like, oh, that was sad, or that was, that was exciting, that was frenetic. No. A little bit? OK. How did it feel to you? Dark. Dark. Yeah. Oh. OK, Ooh, like a little ominous. Yeah, I like that. Anybody else? Kind of horror movie, a little spooky. OK, I'm now going to play it as it should be played. 
okay, with the correct phrasing and intonation and rate. Does anyone recognize it? Flight of the Bumblebees. Does it invoke any feeling? What feeling does it invoke? Rushed, a rushed feeling. Is that different from the ominous feeling you felt before? Would you say your comprehension of the music changed based on its rate and its intonation and its phrasing, even though the notes were played correctly the first time? It does. Okay, so for those of you who said, well, how does processing speed impact comprehension? That's how it impacts comprehension, okay? In order for you to truly comprehend what you're reading, you need to be able to read at a rate with good phrasing and intonation that allows you to access meaning. Does that make sense? Read silently, okay, so that, well, act actually, when you read silently and you are a fluent reader, you do phrase and intone correctly as you're reading. Um, but reading silently doesn't fix a difficulty with fluency, right? Um, we, it, it's, it's for all intents and purposes the same because your speed and your intonation and phrasing are choppy, right? It's like when you were looking at words and you see an introductory phrase like at the beginning, with a comma, you know to take a break, right? And you know that's introducing something that happens at the beginning. If you don't pause there, or you read it in a really choppy fashion, you lose the meaning. How do we get our kids from point A to point B, right? If they're reading the words correctly, but they're not fluent, how do we get them to comprehension? Well, there are things that they can practice. There are places where we can intervene that do impact in particular phrasing and intonation. We may not make their rate as fast as it needs to be, but we can significantly improve the other components. So if we go back and we look at these last two bullets, what we see is that remediation to build what we call automaticity is incredibly important. That means looking and automatically identifying prefixes and suffixes. Not having to sound out P-R-E spells pre, but knowing it just like that. That's a drill that's worth spending your time on, okay? Also, instruction on phrasing. What do you do when you see a comma, right? And intonation, what should your voice sound like when you see the question mark, okay? They seem like little things, but they're hugely powerful, and then, what happens, you take that same music and you might make it slower. It's slower, but the intonation and phrasing are correct, and as such, you are better able to garner meaning. Can you hear that? Just to reiterate, to repeat and rephrase what I said, uh, with regard to processing speed, if reading fluency is impacted, which it likely is, what I would do from a remediation standpoint is look to build automaticity, the automatic components of certain sound symbol correspondence, knowing B says B, knowing prefixes, knowing suffixes, being as automatic with those individual parts for decoding, that's number one. Number two, Really giving and having your student receive direct instruction on phrasing. How do we chunk phrases when we're reading for meaning? And then using punctuation to guide as well. So those three areas are really important for instruction. And those complement the accommodations and modifications that can happen in the classroom. Extended time, reduced workload, those things that we've referred to. So the question is, using assistive technology that gives you the ability to decrease the speed of the text, of the reading, is that valuable? Yes, it is. 
It is, and assistive technology that allows you to see visually how phrasing is being done, which many programs do. They'll highlight chunks and phrases. That's also great practice. Uh, so absolutely, again, don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Assistive tech is great, but the student who listens to it at a, a very, very fast rate isn't gaining benefit, right? So you have to know all of those tools, like slowing the rate. All right, so we're running short on time, so I want to just give a couple of more comments and maybe leave room for a few questions before we finish up. Um, just briefly, we talked about this before, but I want to give you some numbers. Um, comorbidity, again, as Lauren talked about before, with processing speed, your likelihood of having anxiety is elevated. Roughly one-third of students with slow processing speed will have anxiety. We talked before about why that might be. Um, there are many things around processing speed that make you more anxious, whether it be about why your friends are faster than you or just feeling bad about those, uh, the slow processing speed. There are a number of things that can make you anxious, especially in a classroom setting where you're not keeping up as you would like to be. So slow processing speed doesn't cause anxiety, um, and the cause piece is really important. Um, but just briefly, um, when we talk about processing speed and mood, those arrows go both ways. So just like with anxiety, when you have slow processing speed, your increased likelihood, you have increased likelihood to have mood issues as well. So things like depression, irritability, um, anger, things that go with mood problems. It's not just one directional, um, but they cause each other. So people who are of mood issues tend to process information slower as well. It's actually one cardinal symptom of depression is slower, in, slower things in general. So anhedonia, just slow emotion, reduced motiv motivation. Um, reduced energy. So mood and processing speed also go together. Um, and we had just a, cu a couple of last things we want to leave you with. We talked about expectations and acceptance before. Really important is that teachers and parents understand our child's learning profile and that we remind ourselves of it pretty much every single day because that's what we need to do to kind of remember that it's not a matter of lack of energy. It's not a matter of low intelligence and it's really not a matter of just trying to just drive us crazy as parents which it seems like it is, it's really reduced processing speed. Um, think time, which I think is a great thing Melissa talked about, I'm going to come back to you in a moment. I think that's a really simple and powerful tool. Try it at home. I think you'll be impressed. Our kids use it in school here all the time, and it's a really wonderful tool. Um, taking a few deep breaths, both you and your child. Um, and remember, the bumblebee. So we have maybe just a few minutes for questions, and I wonder if we can maybe have a few questions before we, um, before we break. So, yeah, please. Yep. Go ahead. So now you're in my wheelhouse. <laughs> um, so the question was about mindfulness and other relaxation strategies for anxiety. Um, it's a wonderful tool for many of our kids. And as with many things, our younger kids often pick it up even easier um, than us adults and our, our older kids. So. It's nothing's a panacea, but for kids who have struggled with anxiety, especially about slow processing speed, increase, uh, being, having, becoming more aware of your body and your breath and being mindful of your emotions. So I'm really feeling frustrated right now because I'm going slow. Let me take a few deep breaths. It's a huge strategy and really can be helpful, and there's no negative side effects. It's a skill you carry with yourselves everywhere. It's something we do here at, my, at, at lab school often with many of our children. But I encourage you to kind of, even small, it's a really small thing you can use with our kids can be power, very powerful. To teach them how to breathe and to recognize what they're feeling and just name the feeling. Naming the feeling and taking a few deep breaths. Two things. Naming the feeling, taking a few deep breaths, really powerful for our kids and for us as frustrated, stressed, you know, high, high, high intensity parents. So great question. It's a really wonderful strategy. So the question's about um, processing speed and brain injury. Great question. I'm going to see if uh, any, any research um, that we know of. Yeah, I, I don't feel confident enough I, on, on that. I, I'm not aware of anything from what little I've done, but I, I don't feel confident enough to give you a definitive answer. Apologies on that. Um, just while I have the microphone, I just want to point out real quick, um, this book here, Bright Kids Who Can't Keep Up, those that want to go a little bit deeper, um, I really recommend it. It's very user friendly. So if you want to kind of continue the conversation, that's a good resource. Yeah. So now you're in mail my warehouse. <laughs> um, so the question was, is there any genetic correlation um, regarding processing speed? So if there's one, uh, one person in a family, is someone else in the family more likely um, to have processing speed challenges? So yes, a little bit. 
Um, so we, we do things like heritability. Um, we do estimates in twin studies. And processing speed is a heritable um, kind of challenge. However, there are large environmental inputs too. So it's one of those nature nurture things where both pieces are playing a role. So the question is, um, how does this become manifest in schools? How do we get it on the IEP, for example? So just to be clear, slow processing speed is not a disorder, right? It's not a DSM. It's not a diagnosable disorder. It is part of a cognitive profile. It can often be part of a learning disability like reading disability, like, like dyslexia. It can be part of um, related to ADHD. So it's not a disorder by itself. If it's, if it's impacting learning enough, it, it should be manifest as a disorder, like a, a, a learning disability. And that's how it would get on an IEP. So often we'll have kids with dyslexia and we'll say, because of Jack's slow processing speed, he requires 50% extended time on X, Y, and Z. And those recommendations would be about the speed, but the speed isn't a disorder, it's just part of the diagnosis. Does that make sense? Couple, we'll take a few more questions, go ahead. So the question involves scores and processing speed and what's, how, how bad is bad or how low is low. And on IQ tests, which is often how they're measured, the mean is 100 and the average range is 90 to 109. One standard deviation is sort of 15 points, so it's 85 to 115. Once you get below one standard deviation around, so 84 and below, that's a significant weakness. Once you get below 80, and we're talking about the 70s, um, that's a significant weakness. And on percentiles, we're talking about something between um, something below, say, the 16th percentile around. I'm not going to give you a hard number, but once your 25th percentile is sort of the bottom of the average range, once you're below 16, 15, 14, now we're talking about increasingly weak and significant, um, significant weaknesses. So once you're below the low 80s, then it begins to become a, a significant issue. Maybe take a, two more or so. Um, go ahead up there. The question was, um, is brain injury or concussion related to change in processing speed? And the answer is, we don't know, correct? Uh, well, I'll clarify, I don't know. <laughs> what I don't know is how far along that literature has gotten. All right. So um, th there, you ask a wonderful question. This came up on a listserv that we are both on and we're, we're um, following. So the question was, is there any positive attribute associated with processing speed? So is there any upside? Um, and what folks were saying is that uh, there's a potential for thoughtfulness or maybe deeper engagement or, or dwelling on a problem longer. And um, there were other people that sort of weighed in and were kind of contradicting that. So I think there, there is optimism that there could be an upside on the research on the research end. We haven't been able to document that. Do you want to add anything else? I think I would just say that you know because this part of, of our field is is so much in its infancy, uh, we are we are working so hard to help families and teachers understand why kids with processing speed may be struggling, that we don't spend as much time looking sometimes for those positive attributes. Not that they don't exist, not that they couldn't exist in a, in a very positive way, um, but unfortunately we don't have great research right now to say what those are. Yeah. Maybe Lauren will go into that next. I think, Doug, could you, you could probably speak to resilience and what we know about kids who struggle with lots of different areas of learning and, and what that does in terms of a resilience component. Um, I, my, my response was going to be, and this is not a research comment, this is a clinical comment, um, persistence. I've worked here for a long time and I've, I've seen our kids and your kids. When you have slow processing speed and you come to school every day, and you come to school every day and continue to work when it's three or four times harder than those of us without it is, without a research study, I don't know how you don't build up persistence and resilience and frustration tolerance, all those things you're talking about. So um, as a clinician, the answer in my mind is absolutely yes, that our kids, just by virtue of them working as hard as they have to because their, their car just goes that much slower, they still get to the destination. That's an incredible thing in terms of work ethic, persistence, and resilience. So I think it's a great, great question. So we're gonna stop. We'll be here for a few minutes to take initial questions. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We're great, glad to see you. Thank you.